This is MJ. I'm an author. I'm an artist. I'm an analyzer. You can find all my work at mjmunoz.com. Henshin Inspection presents Writer Tears. This time I will be talking about part six of the Kamen Rider manga. You might think this is my last time I'll be talking about the Kamen Rider manga, but you would be wrong because there's extras that are in here beyond part six because this is the lovely Seven Seas uh, Entertainment or Seven Seas Manga. I'm not sure what they call themselves. Uh, omnibus hardcover 50th anniversary edition so there are bonuses in the end which they're mostly kind of art and like tiny little like you know one or two page stories if not yeah one or two page stories and i'll be talking about those at a later date and uh there's lots of cool stuff that appeared just in this chapter that i'm going to want to talk about and share in shorts or you know tiktok sized videos which you can find you know wherever uh they will be i guess I guess they won't be, well, maybe I'll compile them all audio uh, in uh, one audio episode at some point later, but they'll trickle out over time and just, it'll be for fun. So anyway, check out um, the website and look at my social media stuff to be informed on all of that when it comes out. But you are not here to hear me promote myself. You're here to hear me talk about Common Writer, and we're going to go ahead and do that now, or I'm going to go ahead and do that now. So let me tell you, the sixth and final chapter of the Kamen Rider manga is a big deal. Uh, I really liked it. Um, there's a lot to say about it. There's a lot of spoiler spoilery stuff to say about it, so I will actually hold off on saying everything I can, but I think I'll still talk about the core emotional things of it. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about it generally, and then I'm going to talk about my favorite art and favorite drama uh, pieces from the manga. So, generally, uh, yeah, I think I can say this. The threat of Shocker becomes as big as it can be. And uh, and yet we learn new things that make it seem like whatever victory Kamen Rider has here in the end of the chapter, that the battle will continue. And besides that, Ishtamori does a really interesting thing. And I've heard this described, I don't know if it's unfairly or uncharitably or... I don't know, ironically, maybe, um, that the final chapter of, or, yeah, chapter, or part of the Kamen Rider manga kind of veers off, and it's not really about Kamen Rider, Kamen rider anymore. It turns into this thing about nuclear war and uh, destruction of humanity by their own hands and things like that. And while there is mention of Hiroshima and the ill effects of the radiation of, you know, the nuclear bomb, or bombs, that the United States uh, unleashed on Japan in whatever year that was. Was that 54 or not? I don't know. I'm not a uh, dates guy from history, okay? So, you know, regardless, it happened and it was terrible. So, uh, it does sort of focus on that, but it still is a common Rider story. Uh, Ichimoji is still running around, um, riding the bike, wearing the mask, wearing his second skin <laughs> under his clothes to protect himself from getting shot and things like that. And that's all there, and it's still good. But it's interesting because, you know, while uh, Part 5 humanized Ichimonji by putting him in contact with his hometown and his family, namely his mother and father, who were, uh, you know, spoilers for that, but I'm happy to share because that was the last one, not this one. Uh, but you should still go read it if you haven't. It's a good manga. It's a great story telling. Um, he encounters his mother and his father who are being controlled by Shocker in an experiment as they're ramping up and doing different things to test out their abilities to control human beings. And when I say human beings, I am contrasting human beings with uh, the Kaizo Ningen, the, the cyborgs or the modified humans who have been directly modified by uh, Shocker and had their minds altered through surgery or through whatever other means so that they can be controlled. And said this is a way to uh, broadcast control over humanity and they're testing it out in the little fishing village that Ichimonji is from. But here we get to see a different approach to controlling people. Uh, but the game is still the same. Control over humanity. And I believe it was the first chapter of, which is actually interesting, the first chapter, not just the first part, but the first chapter in the first part of the Kamen Rider manga that talks about Shocker wanting to make normal people, make ordinary human beings, into cattle, and they basically wanted to control and manipulate them. And I'll veer off into a funny direction for uh, less than a minute here. Uh, the use of the word cattle is interesting. Um, sheep 
well, cattle usually makes me think of cows, but sheep, I think, are another uh, perhaps better example uh, to talk about the concept. So you've heard about, you know, wake up sheeple or, you know, you're just a sheep, that kind of thing that people just, you know, who don't question things, who just follow along with what they're being told, with what a larger entity is telling them uh, are sheep. And that's because sheep are uh, <laughs> traditionally understood to be very easy to manipulate and utilize as a, uh, you know, food source as a you know, fiber source and by fiber i mean the the wool on them uh as a source for their you know milk even and that they're very easy to control versus like a goat is wild and a goat will get out and a goat is not easy to uh to handle or manipulate um i heard pigs are i'm kind of interested in animal animal husbandry and stuff i have heard that pigs are notoriously difficult to control and to keep locked in uh, they break through fencing, they test fencing, kind of like the velociraptors in Jurassic Park. They're smart, they're testing, they never touch the same place twice, uh, that they figure things out. Um, however, uh, you know, sheep and cattle, um, even cattle, um, if you've never driven through uh, more rural parts of the country, you'll see, um, or you haven't seen this like I have, but there's these uh, sections of fencing that are open and across a road, uh, but there's like these tubes on the ground and those are cat. I can't remember, they call them cattle, I don't know, they're like speed bumps for cows though, and apparently something about the way that bumps on the ground uh, are set up, they will hurt the hooves of the cows, so they won't want to cross them, um, and the uh, farmers, ranchers, have figured out that you can put them down for a little while, and then uh, cows will learn not, they will learn to avoid those things, and then you can just, just uh, paint stripes on the ground that look like they're those things and the cow um, whether it's due to limited vision or like a lack of uh, sophistication in the mind of the cow the cow will see that and say that's going to hurt me I'm not walking across that and they will stay in and you only have to introduce them to the concept of it in one place and then make sure all your cattle have been introduced to that thing and then put up something that looks like it but isn't actually it and will actually hurt them if they walk across it but they will stay hemmed in or stay in the area where you've you know told them that they must be similarly uh shocker is trying to figure out how they can uh invest in a few individuals turning them into kaizening into their cyborg soldiers and completely controlling their minds and causing them to do you know whatever they want to do in order to have the greater net effect of controlling vast swaths of humanity and I, probably whoever they can't um control they'll just kill because it's easy to just kill them and get them out of the way while the rest of the people are compliant. So it's interesting that Ishnamori, it's interesting and it's good writing that Ishnamori brought that back in here in the end to, to discuss it because he's kind of closing the loop on that idea. So, uh, that's my general talk that went on a little bit longer into, well, I mean the, the importance of how shocker seeks to control people is, uh, it's thematic and it's very much a part of the DNA of Kamen Rider. He isn't just a superhero. He's a superhero who fights for human freedom and for the ability for people to not be controlled and not manipulated and not used by other people. And that extends beyond just the superheroics, uh, you know, and the whole shocker thing. It's... <laughs> I think it's emblematic of something else, and it's it's uh, emblematic of a of spirit of rebellion and freedom that I think Ishtamori was a fan of, even though uh, in that there's also care for other people. So it's not like, oh, I'm free, and you know I don't care what happens to the rest of you. It's I free, and I want I'm free, and I want the rest of you to be free. And I think that's part of the spirit of Common Rider, and I think it's pretty interesting. So uh, yeah, that's my general thoughts, and I really liked it. The artwork was great, but I'm going to talk about specifically the artwork and. Uh, you know, the most dramatic and the most cool looking artwork in just a moment or two. So hold on. Okay. So if you are using a podcasting 2.0 app in order to listen to this podcast, uh, you will have the benefit of me using chapters here and in the chapter break or whatever, the chapter image will be a really cool piece of artwork. Now this isn't the coolest, but it's almost the coolest and it's emblematic of uh, how good Ishinomori style is here, and it's just, it's really, like, there's a couple of pieces that I like better than I'm going to save for later, uh, to share, but this is really cool, it looks really dynamic, it's really awesome, uh, I, honestly, I, I feel kind of weird, and 
badly about this, but I can't tell what kind of creature this is supposed to be. Maybe it's like a pterodactyl man, but I'm pretty sure it has bird feet, so maybe it's supposed to be like that condor man um, idea that Eastern Warriors played with a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure, um, but it's a freaky flying thing, and it attacks uh, Kamen Raider, it attracts Ijimonji when he's in this... Um, you know, underground shocker base thing, and there's this enormous shaft of, I, I don't know, there's this enormous shaft or column or pillar with all this data and, like, weird computer stuff on it. Um, <laughs> and so if you were a Star Wars fan, you'd know what I mean uh, when I say Greeblies. Um, <laughs> it's got all over it. But, like, it just looks freaking amazing. This thing, you know, it, it's supposed to be a serious threat to the writer. There's all these um, Kaiser and coming after him. And he does like a gravity defying impossible rider kick where he's going up he's <laughs> the the guy who he's fighting is flying down at him and somehow he's uh kicking it looks like he's kicking you know up at him from the ground like he's such a powerful uh warrior he has such powerful legs for jumping that he's able to actually rocket himself off of the floor and do a flying kick into this flying guy that hurts him and i the shoulder it there are ripples where Ryder's foot is hitting like the flesh is being distorted let me think of the best way uh if you've ever seen Ruini Kenshin uh when uh okay Kenshin has somebody who becomes a rival of his in the show who is not the main villain um and at one point Kenshin uses his most powerful attack and it's actually the first time that the villains see the most powerful attack used and it looks like the guy got killed but afterwards you well it it looks like the guy got killed, and you see his injury afterward, and it looks nasty. It's like his flesh has been, like, like I don't know, like, pushed away. It's really weird. Just the way it, like, ripples and is distorted from where it was impacted uh, is really gross. And uh, this um, shoulder distortion on this flying creature that the writer does is similar, but it's not as extreme. Like, uh, Watsky went way farther than this with that... <laughs> with that depiction. Although I've only seen it in the anime, I haven't seen it in the manga yet, so uh, I couldn't, you know, confirm for sure, but it's very, uh, it's very cool. And it's like kind of a subtle detail, and, you know, Ishimori could have put more work into it, he could have done a follow-up panel that showed it better, but it feels like it's just the beginning of the impact. And there's a nice, like, impact, uh, a visual effect, I guess you could say, around his foot where it's hitting, uh, the cyborg, his brother cyborg, who he's, you know, having to kill, uh, in order to complete this mission. And, uh, yeah, it just, it looks really cool. It's just like a really super great dynamic, um, image and it's got great color balance or great, you know, balance of, you know, negative and positive space. And, uh, it's just super cool. So, uh, I, I had to, when I saw this, I thought, oh, that's the thumbnail image. I might work more on there, but you know, for sure that one is going to be part of the thumbnail image and it's pretty much, it's that in the, and the cover of the 50th anniversary edition. So that's, uh, that's what I have for my favorite art piece from this and it's it's probably like the art showcase it's the best of Ishimori's art in a single image this is actually it's not uh, in a single panel it's not a page it's a single panel and it's just it's got everything that you want from Ishimori okay and again if you're using a podcasting 2.0 app or if you're looking at the notes on mg1news.com you'll be able to see this specific art piece that I want to talk about and it's Oh, sorry, I'm just looking into the art pieces. I'm swiping to the one I want to talk about. Uh, it's the most dramatic piece. And uh, I think, well, I, I'm going to read some of it to you. And I don't think this really counts as spoilers, except, well, it is spoilers for the manga, but it's, I think it's kind of a meme. It was a meme between me and people who were talking about Gone Rider with each other a few years back. Um, but uh, anyway, <laughs> well, let me just put it this way uh, the big bad guy. I'll just say that. The big bad guy that Kamen Rider is fighting at the end of this chapter, or towards the end of this chapter, um, first of all, it's a really cool visual effect what they're doing with him, even though it's just kind of like, like, oh, I think I understand what it's supposed to, um, what it's supposed to be a visual reference to, uh, which I won't talk about because you got to read it for yourself, but he basically says something to Kamen Rider that, like, hurts his heart. <laughs> the writer, like, kind of, he, he doesn't kill over, but he, like, stops and, like, move forward and he puts his hand on his heart and uh it's translated as <laughs> but uh basically this guy is telling him uh something that he doesn't want to hear something that he doesn't want to believe something that he's having a hard time listening to and instead of being the uh force of nature moving like the wind moving with the power of the wind that common usually is he has basically 
stopped short and uh he's been stopped in his track by words like this man has done so many crazy things he's fought so hard and so long and you know moved through so many obstacles and yet mere words from this fellow uh and it really is more than the words if you you know read it in the context of it but uh it seems as if mere words stop him cold in his tracks and leave him open to attack from this guy. And I just think that's it's so cool because, uh, again, like I said, it's symbolic. It, 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 there is a secondary thing going on, but it is the words that are helping to stop him. And it's just hitting him so hard that he can't believe what's going on. And I think it's really interesting. <laughs> I think it's really interesting. Um, so... Uh, yeah, chapter six of the Kamen Rider manga, it leaves more story for Kamen Rider to have. Um, it leaves more possibility for future stories, like I said. And uh, it gives you a world where evil's not fully defeated, but where our heroes triumph over that evil and uh, know that it's something they have to spend the rest of their life struggling against. I wouldn't say that the ending is actually bleak because we get away from here... Uh, the writer had somebody helping him out who recovers from his injuries and they are going to go ahead and keep working against this force. But there's a very personal connection that uh, Ichimoji had with this uh, lady and her brother who I mentioned at the beginning. Um, he's got a disease based on radiation. It's a leukemia, actually. And his sister is taking care of him. And by the end of it, the boy dies. And Ichimoji and uh, Junko wonder... I don't know, kind of like what's going to happen with the rest of humanity. You know, they know about the threat from Shocker and they know about, you know, they, they dealt Shocker a big blow, but they know that that's not the final blow, that there will be more uh, fighting with Shocker in the future. And um, they wonder if all the technology that Shocker has and all the technology that even, you know, the writers have uh, at their disposal is worthwhile or if man is using it the right way because this boy could have been saved by the kind of technology that shocker uses to make their modified humans um and yet he wasn't <laughs> that technology was uh, lost or destroyed or you know the access to it was taken away because of this war that shocker wants to wage in order to control people and this you know war for freedom that the writers fighting against them and uh, <laughs> the the statement at the end and the, the subtitle for this episode is basically that you know with all the power that you know these people have had in their hands that all the p power and the science and the technology that's been developed um, by Shocker and by humanity in general because the you know the, the Shocker basically co-opted a technology that was developed by the Japanese government and uh, you may say that. <laughs> Uh, they turned it evil, but it might have been evil already in <laughs> what it was used for or planned for. Yeah, that's kind of up for debate for you. Um, but anyway, they say with all this power and where it was directed, maybe we were fighting the wrong enemy all along. And I think that's something interesting. And it kind of begs the question. It leaves the question, uh, which I think is the very last thing in the manga, actually, as, you know, what are we fighting? And, you know, what is the real enemy that we want to defeat in our lives in this world with you know our collective energy as japanese citizens um which you know, obviously <laughs> i'm being a little facetious there because we're not japanese citizens at least i'm not and um you know this can be applied to places other than japan and it's just moored in a specific culture and context uh based on the fact that it's a product of a certain culture <laughs> And therefore, it has its own context. But we can take that idea and ask ourselves, are we fighting the right battle? Are we you know, engaging in the right struggle? Are we putting our efforts towards the correct things uh, in our lives? And I think it's really cool that a comic book about Karate Bugman made for a TV show about a Karate Bugman uh, in order to sell toys of Karate Bugman uh, masks and whatever else, uh, toys and, you know, transformation devices and things like that, uh, can ask these questions and can take the time to kind of delve into that deeper kind of storytelling. And that's part of what I love about Tokusatsu in general and, you know, Ishinomori's contributions to it mostly because, uh, I just think there was a, a real heart for humanity, uh, 
in the man and a care for society at large. Um, and I think that shows through here in his concern and his desire to ask and, and examine and this big question and he doesn't give you the answer necessarily but he does raise the question and you know do a you know reductio ad absurdum that you know if this kid's gonna die from cancer because you know the writer has to fight the evil shocker organization who has the technology to save this boy um but just you know they can't focus on that because there's the there's a war going on so they got to focus on what they need to focus on then you know <laughs> is it even worthwhile and i think the answer is yes it is worthwhile but you need to have the clarity to not be thrown off by everything in life so that you can focus and know what to do and do what's right and do what really is important and what matters and make sure that you're always fighting the right battle because you're going to have to fight, I think, no matter what you do in life, but you have to make sure that you're fighting the right battle and that you're choosing the correct enemy to go after. Anyway, uh, that did not go at all how I expected it to go. It turned out to be double the length I wanted it to be, um, but I had fun talking about it, and um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. So check out uh, the rest of my uh, stuff on Writer Tears. I'm going to be talking about uh, many common writer things, and I'm going to basically uh, move from one common writer topic to another. I don't know which uh, show I will talk about next, um, or manga, so stay tuned, and you will find out along with me. Uh, I have lots of other podcasts, lots of other review series. I've got um, a show where I talk about comic books, which uh, is actually going to be shifting to talking about manga. It's called Swinging Through Comics. I'll be releasing that soon. Check out uh, MJ Munoz for the uh, n full podcast release um, and kind of like a soft relaunch type thing that I'm doing with that. And you can check out Going Ultra, where I'm talking about Ultraman Blazar, which is just coming out the second episode which should be out very soon around the time of the release of this episode and you can check out what else can you check out uh let's see oh story over everything if you want to follow my journey as an author artist or as an author where i'm um sharing with you some of the stuff i'm writing and my writing process and my thoughts on writing and on the you know the craft and uh and basically i share with you things that i'm writing and and my process so that you can see what it's like from the inside as well as I'll be reading to you some of my stories um that's called story over everything and again you can find links to all of this over at mjmunios.com anyway I hope that you're well this is MJ signing out <laughs>